May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strong rock and our redeemer. Amen. I came across this passage in Donna Leon's mystery novel, Unto Us a Son is Given. It's one of my besetting sins. I'm obsessed with mystery novels. It's what I do. But maybe God was merciful to me because as I was reading a mystery novel, I came across this sentence. Burnett thought about how taking a look at one's unconscious motives and prejudices was like Walking barefoot in cloudy water. You never know whether you are going to step on something disgusting or bang your toe into a rock. Sometimes I think we decide, describe Lent that way. It's sort of like stepping on something disgusting or banging our toe into a rock. I particularly identify with the last part because I have never been particularly successful with my Lenten disciplines. It's more like banging a toe into the rock. Lent is, in some ways, a challenge. An honest, ruthless self-examination can be like discovering something disgusting or banging your toe into a rock looking honestly and ruthlessly into our souls like a determined avenger or a self-appointed prosecuting attorney, we will, from time to time, see things that disgust us and we do hit rocks. We hit rocks which are those personal deficits that never seem to improve. I just don't love my sister-in-law much before Lent and sometimes after Lent. It may be true on a deep level that the unexamined life is not worth living. Great spirit, uh, spiritual teachers have said that. And I think on some level that's profoundly true. But it is also true that the examined life can be the occasion for despair. Perhaps few folks wake up on Ash Wednesday infused with joy. Oh, good, it's Ash Wednesday. But my view of Lent, and maybe I'm, if I'm being completely honest, my struggle with Lent changed dramatically for me. On Ash Wednesday, 2009, I had just done the noon service at Christ Church Cathedral in Louisville. I had, had imposed ashes on all sorts of critters, Baptists and Methodists and street people and Roman Catholics that didn't want to walk three more blocks to the cathedral <laughs> and all sorts of Episcopalians that hung out with me during Lent. It was just a wonderful liturgy, but at the end, I will never forget, my assistant came rushing to me as I was shaking hands in the narthex, and she said, Ted, you've got to come with me right now, and you've got to go to Norton Hospital. And it seems that a young couple in Campbellsville, Kentucky, a couple whose wedding I actually had performed, she had gone into labor at the seventh month of gestation and had given birth to two tiny identical twin girls at Norton Hospital. And within seven minutes, I was in the hospital, I was in a gown, I was in gloves, I had on a mask and the hat, and a nurse handed me a syringe full of distilled water, and I took the first little baby girl and she fit in the palm of my one hand. And I took that syringe of water and I said, I baptize you 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I then took the other little baby girl in the palm of my hand, and with the syringe of sterile water, I baptized her in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And with tears streaming down my face, and the Father's face, and the nurse's faith faces, we said the Lord's Prayer. And then I put a drop or two of water on my thumb, traced the cross on their tiny foreheads, and said, You are sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked, marked as Christ's own forever. Ever since, Ash, by the way, they lived. Ever since <laughs> Ash Wednesday, 2009, I cannot nor will I ever separate the crosses that Ben and I are going to trace this evening on your foreheads from that one definitive cross that was put on your forehead and mine on the day of our baptism. And it's at this point that I want you to remember the harshness of the gospel. You hypocrites, do not be like the hypocrites. Watch out for the hypocrites. Bad night for the hypocrites. But you know where that word comes from. It comes from the Greek word hypocris, which is the mask that is worn when performing a Greek drama. A hypocrite is a person who is so insecure that she puts on the mask to cover something despairing about their identity. Jesus said, for God's sake, literally unmask yourself. Unmask yourself. I delight in your face. I have marked you and claimed you as my own forever. You don't need the posturing. You don't need the pretension. And you don't need the mask. Take it off. And let's have a secret rendezvous where I, working upon your heart, teach you just the truth that you are, and I am, and we all are, simply and utterly loved to death. The only reason we go through all of what we're going through tonight is so that we will have confidence that we are, in fact, marked as Christ's own forever, even though we are dusty even though there are parts of us that are probably disgusting and it feels like as we try our annual attempts at self-improvement, we're just hitting a rock. That's all true. But it's not true capital T. What is true capital T is that we are marked as Christ's own forever and that we are literally loved to death as we will learn again on Good Friday and at the vigil, and on Easter Day. Because you see, we have to do it over and over again because we just can't believe it. And at least we can't believe it all at the time. And we posture and pretend the perfection that just isn't the truth. And Jesus, and sometimes those masks that we wear become very heavy. And sometimes those masks that we wear are constructed in such a way that we can barely breathe. And Jesus said, just take them off. Just take them off. You don't have to posture and you do not have to pretend because you are so loved. I think Lent reminds me of a kind of awakening. I don't know about you, and this is going to be something a little personal about old Bishop Ted that you didn't know before. 
But sometimes, and maybe some of you have had this dream. I have a repeated anxiety dream. I have it maybe once every two or three years that I'm about to marry the wrong person. I go through all this preparation, all the expectations. We're walking down the aisle, and she's the wrong person. And I don't know what to do, and my heart starts to race. And I wake up, and Barbara's right there. And I didn't marry the wrong person. That's what Lent is. It's a stretchy 40 days of dawn that we are bound to the right person. That he is our life and our all. That he is delighted in us and we are the beloved. And sometimes it takes 40 days to relearn all the stupidities that have captured and captivated us over the past year. But it's, it's like waking up and realizing that the nightmare has passed. Sometimes I think one of my best life friends lived in the 17th century. I've been in love with his thinking ever since I first read him as an English major. When I was about 18 or 19 years old, his name is George Herbert. I love him because I love the way he loves God. And I love the way he lets God love him. Maybe you've heard this poem. If you like it, go Google it. All you need to remember is love bade me welcome. And it's going to pop right up. I know that because it did for me this morning. <laughs> now, the poem is a dialogue between George Herbert and Jesus. Love bade me welcome, yet my soul drew back guilty of dust and sin. But quick-eyed love, observing me grow slack from my first entrance in, drew nearer to me, sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. A guest, I answered, worthy to be here. Love said, you shall be he. I, the unkind, ungrateful, ah, oh, my dear, I cannot look on thee. Love took my hand and smiling did reply, who made the eyes? But I, truth, Lord, but I have marred them. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. And know you not, says love, who bore the blame? My dear, then I will serve. You must sit down, says love, and taste my meat. So I did sit and eat.